Welcome to Unpacking Armenian Studies and to this new limited series we'll, we're calling Ukraine, Armenia and War. I'll be speaking to politicians, scholars, journalists and diplomats, asking the questions that bring us to a better understanding of this war and its aftermath from an Armenian perspective and from a broader Caucasus perspective, because here political and economic prospects are so deeply entwined with the various parties in and around this war. Of course, these days you could say the whole world is entwined. Um, we're doing this also because this is a humanitarian disaster that has gripped us all and scared us, especially since this is violence against the people that the aggressor considers its brethren. It's really very familiar. After all, Azerbaijan considers Gharapal its territory and its people its own citizens, yet it waged war. And now under the cover of a Russia and a world occupied by the disaster in Ukraine, the daily violence continues. Today is March 11th. There is no sign that the violence in Ukraine, the war that began with Russia invading Ukraine, a sovereign country on February 24th is abating. Ukrainian soldiers and citizens are dying. Russian soldiers are dying. Russians are bringing Middle Eastern mercenaries. It's all too familiar and quite unnecessary and absurd as we watch. Um, in fact, the EU is now contemplating accelerated membership for Ukraine, Moldova, and Georgia. So in the context of all of this, uh, we're going to be speaking to today's guests to better understand how the Ukrainian diaspora is responding to this crisis of universal scale, because of course the war in 2020, uh, I would say permanently changed relations between Armenia and its diaspora. My guest today is Dr. Dominique Arel, who is Associate Professor of Political Science and Chair of Ukrainian Studies at the University of Ottawa in Canada. And Dr. Arel's interests range from nationalism and language politics to politics of identity. Dr. Arel, thank you for giving us the time today when I am sure you are more than busy. My pleasure. Um, can you start by doing the impossible and giving us the three minute version of Ukrainian diaspora history? So um, there's been four waves of Ukrainian migration to Canada going back to the late 19th century. And the first two waves, so up to First World War and then in the interwar period, mostly in the 1920s, were, you could say, um, economic waves. You had um, Ukrainian peasants, to use the European terminology, um, migrating to Canada um, in particular to Western Canada um, in order to um, work the land. I mean, the land was in short supply in that part of Ukraine where they were migrating from, which was the Western part of Ukraine, Western Ukraine. So right now, when we hear about the city of Lviv, which has become like the pivot for this, these millions of people trying to, to flee the refugees, they go through Western Ukraine in order to go to Poland, Slovakia, Hungary, or Romania. And Western Ukraine at that time, the core province is known as Galicia, where the city of Lviv is located, was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and was administered by uh, actually the Polish nobility because the, Poland did not exist as a state, had been partitioned uh, since the late um, 18th century, um, but at the administrative level, the Poles were ruling uh, Galicia. So you had these, we would say in North American terms, these farmers invited to settle in these uh, lands of Western Canada that were being uh, the word, well, the word is not very politically correct nowadays when we say colonized, but settled by these European um, farmers. So which is why the historic uh, Ukrainian communities of Canada um, originate from, again, Manitoba, uh, Saskatchewan, Alberta, Winnipeg was the, uh, the center like of, of Ukrainian diaspora prior to World War II. But then you, we get to a third wave and a very different wave, even though in terms of geography, 
um, these people overwhelmingly came from relatively the same areas of Western Ukraine. And here I'm referring to a post-World War II wave uh, consisting of political refugees or in the terminology of the time, displaced persons. You had millions of these DPs in, uh, in Europe in, in Actually, they yes. had to be settled in camps at that time, many of them in Germany, in post-war yes, Germany. Yes, the parallel Armenian experience, absolutely. Exactly. And here they were fleeing uh, Soviet annexation of their territories. Because again, I told you that Western Ukraine and the core Galicia here had been part of Austria or the Austrian Empire or Poland in the interwar period. And it's very important to understand they, that territory, so the Western Ukrainians, had never been ruled in history by Moscow. For 500 years, they were just in a different political zone altogether. And Moscow, so now under the, the Soviet Union, illegally annexed these territories. This was actually following the pact with, with Hitler in 1939, the so-called Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact of Non-Aggression. Uh, essentially uh, divided up Poland. You know, Poland was destroyed after the, the 39 invasion and the uh, uh, Eastern territories of Poland or the Western territories then of Ukraine uh, were taken by um, the Soviet Union. And then the Soviet yeah. Union, the Soviet forces came back in 44 uh, when the And that Germans was the third way. Yeah, because of course, Germany invaded in 41. And then you had hundreds of thousands of refugees. And, and then many of them settled in Canada, uh, United States, Australia were the other prime destinations. But this was a political migration, very, very uh, highly um, nationally and politically conscious. This was not an economic migration and they tended to settle in Eastern Canada, Montreal originally, and then increasingly Toronto, because Toronto became the economic powerhouse in, uh, in Canada. So that was the third wave. And the fourth? The fourth is since the demise of the Soviet Union, we've had the Ukrainians, contrary to the first three waves, coming from all corners of Ukraine, all 25 provinces of Ukraine, perhaps with a little disproportion still from the West because of family ties and so forth, but from all over and continuously for the past 30 years. So this is the only migration or the only diaspora, clearly in Canada, which has experienced sustained um, renewal, let's say, of migrations over a over yes. hundred years. And what were the ties during these 30 years? What have the ties been back to Ukraine for all of the the, the the descendants of these waves? Is it travel? Is it culture? Is it family? Yeah, uh, in the last 30 years. So since yeah. the collapse of the Soviet Union, yeah. so since Ukraine became independent. Um, what um, the, the Ukrainian diaspora is very, very well organized. It's not the only diaspora that's very so well organized, but it may be the one which uh, has more um, political influence in, because of its concentration in uh, a number of key uh, electoral ridings. So actually the Ukrainian vote counts in our very, very contested elections in Canada. Um, so in the last 30 years, we have seen um, the development, the further development of um, these, um, these links between uh, the diaspora in Ukraine in terms of investment, in terms of people going actually expatriates that go and, and live and work in sometimes in politics or in, in NGOs or in, in business. In um, Ukraine. In Ukraine and all kinds of technical aids. So there is um, this, um, obviously these cultural ties, although the cultural ties tended to be with, um, uh, descendants of uh, uh, migrants that came from Western Ukraine. So the, 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 the personal links with Western Ukrainians, understandably Are enough, the reason that I explained, particularly the, the children and, gra and, and grandchildren of the political migration um, the, of the, the post-World War II are, have been very active. The organization that um, you say has been 
very strong on the diaspora end. Is that met by any sort of formal mechanisms for diaspora interaction, engagement, participation from the home country end? Yes, um, the, the, the advantage here in Canada, but I guess the very well organized diasporas have similar structures, is they have like an umbrella organization known as the Ukrainian Canadian Congress that coordinates a lot, particularly a lot of the political uh, um, work done in, in terms of lobbying with the Canadian government and various agencies and then interacting with uh, um, Ukraine itself. And interestingly enough, if you allow me a, a little segue here, um, it's actually the Canadian government historically that pressured the various um, social and religious and cultural Ukrainian associations back in the 1930s to pool their resources together. And the reason was that, you know, the 1930s was the depression and that you had, and as I told you, these early waves were economic waves. They were not political waves. So Ukrainian national consciousness, interestingly enough, uh, often developed in Canada, not at the, at the original point of migration. Um, but because of the depression, you also had a very strong, um, communist Ukrainian diaspora. That is a Ukrainian diaspora in the 1930s that saw the Soviet Union, uh, remember in the context of the depression, as the alternative to the collapse or the failure of capitalism. Um, and they were very well organized. They, there was even a daily newspaper in Toronto in Ukrainian, but on the leftist side, on the communist side. But and 1939 just of course, smashed all of that, and the Canadian government actually seized the um, um, the property, like the town halls and so forth, of um, the Ukrainian communists, and they never recovered from that. And at that and at that very moment, the Ukrainian Canadian Congress was created again uh, through uh, the inducement, if not pressure, of the authorities in 1940. And that vehicle has worked very well in, in the post-independent period. And your question was in terms of the direct uh, linkages with Ukraine. Uh, Ukrainian uh, political elites have understood from the early going that Canada, even though Canada is a mid-sized power, okay, member of the G7, but clearly not of the, the political or economic stature of France, Germany, let alone the United States, but that because of the historic links, Canada is kind of pulling above its weight um, and has this um, special relations, which translates into um, very specific programs. And I could give you an example that's very topical. Um, sure, but uh, one of the questions I would like you to address before we get to the, uh, you know, the situation from the Orange Revolution on, one of the topics I'd like to, you to address is whether these ideological uh, linkages to the home country became a problem for the diaspora, regardless of the existence of an umbrella organization or not. In other words, the pro-USSR, the anti-USSR uh, strains, how did that impact diaspora life? But yes, please. Yeah, well, so, 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 so the diaspora was divided in the 1930s and um, because of the, um, basically the, the policy of um, expropriation by the Canadian government, 1939 of, of the, the, the Canadian communist uh, organizations and buildings, um, that, that tension really vanished after World War II. The, the kind of the leftist movement became marginal and and also the new reality is that now you had a very politicized migration. Um, and new wave of migration that quite rapidly took control over uh, on the, the major organizations. And I'm referring here to, again, the, the post-war uh, migration. So you had new players who many of them came out of the um, insurgency, there was a massive anti-Soviet insurgency in Western Ukraine around an organization known as the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists, the OUN. And uh, 
Ukrainian insurgent army, UPA, which um, incredibly enough began during World War II, but lasted through the late 1940s um, and was eventually uh, vanished, well, destroyed by Soviet power, the, the secret police, and known back then as the NKVD, but through massive repression that involved the deportation of some hundreds of thousands of Western Ukrainians on, on the principle of collective responsibility. They were deporting entire families related to alleged uh, insurgents. And that migration in the West was very much linked, if not personally linked, but certainly in spirit to the crushing experience that they had uh, lived through. Um, so, so it can be said that the Ukrainian diaspora was fairly uniformly not supportive of Ukraine's being a Soviet Republic up until the point of independence. It was um, overwhelmingly anti-Soviet, yes. So certainly in terms of, and at the organizational stage, I'm not talking about uh, the community level, uh, it was entirely anti-Soviet. There was no question about it. Um, and then how from was, the post-war period, yeah. Yes, yes. How was independence met? 1991, was it, oh God, this is wonderful, or oh my God, how is this country going to survive? Oh no, no, it was, um, the community was absolutely ecstatic. Um, and Canada was the first, I think Poland beat Canada by maybe 15 minutes in terms of rec recognizing uh, Ukraine as an independent state. No, the diaspora was ecstatic and it changed dramatically then the nature of their work. Uh, because when I was talking about lobbying, well, suddenly Ukraine was a state and now was about to get an embassy in Ottawa. And uh, so the work suddenly became very, very uh, practical um, in terms of what is it, uh, what it is that Canada can do to help uh, Ukraine reform. There was a whole lot to, on the economic reform front, agriculture, I mean, um, even social credit, the development of these uh, banking institutions. So Canada through um, the uh, Canadian, at that time was known as the Canadian International Development Agency, CEDA, uh, had, was working in 35 different countries, like the, in terms of priority, and the only one in Europe was Ukraine because of its political weight in Canadian politics. And so in the last decade, CEDA and its successor agencies did a whole lot, but in always in partnership, either officially or the fact that you had Canadian Ukrainians as civil servants working for these agencies or becoming politicians. You may be, uh, maybe you are aware that the, the second most powerful politician in Canada right now, yes. the vice uh, uh, prime minister is, uh, is a Canadian Ukrainian. Christian um, Freeland, yes. Yeah, Christia Freeland. Yes, um, and she's, you know, very vocal and visible and, and has been in American journalism and politics. Um, because we're not going to make it to today unless I jump, I'm going to jump. If we jump to 2004 and the Orange Revolution, can you talk about how the diaspora responded? Um, and then, of course, the Maidan revolution and then Zelensky's election. How did the diaspora respond both practically in terms of actual activity, whether charitable or business, and also how did it respond politically? And uh, how did it represent the, this political evolution in Ukraine to Canadian and Western uh, entities? Yeah, but in terms of social organization already from the Orange Revolution, I mean, there's been three like turning points, uh, the Orange Revolution, Maidan, and now the, the full-scale war. Um, the capacity very rapidly even to fundraise outside of government here by uh, through uh, community channels or Ukrainian entrepreneur with deep pockets, and uh, which was, far less the case in the 1950s or 60s, but the results here of kind of these uh, second generation Ukrainians becoming mainstream in, in Canadian business. Um, so tremendous ability to, again, pool resources and, and also um, partner and coordinate with, uh, with the motherland because 
you also had, as I said, a lot of expatriates. They were already on site, um, and they had their entrances to uh, um, the key, um, even political parties. So we talk about the Orange Revolution here. I mean, the, the party of the, can the candidate who eventually became president, Yushchenko. Um, yeah. You had all kinds of very often behind the scenes um, uh, operations. Um, quietly, very often involving the Canadian embassy in, in, in Ukraine. Canada is very good for doing things, not necessarily in the limelight. Um, but yes. because, <laughs> because it has this comparative advantage in Ukraine, having all these assets, uh, often even linguistic assets. You know, you have Christopher Freeland who can pick up the phone and talk to President Zelensky in his own language. Yeah. doesn't have to, to use an interpreter. Um, um, so that has been on display in at the time of the Orange Revolution and Maidan and currently. But let me add another important point. Um, I did allude to the fact that uh, the Ukrainian Canadian um, electorate is concentrated in a number. There may be up to 12 ridings across the country. A riding the Ukrainian the riding meaning that these electoral districts, we use the first past yeah. the post system in, uh, in Canada, uh, where the Ukrainian Canadian vote counts. Um, and what it means in practice is that on these fundamental issues, uh, like the stolen election in 2004, or uh, the police brutality on Maidan, and then, um, and then the annexation of Crimea and the war in Donbass, and obviously right now, the Ukrainian question in Canada has never been politically controversial. There's no division, whereas you had at least until two, two weeks ago, let's say, in major countries like France and particularly Germany, actually um, a seesaw in terms of, you know, we, we have to be cautious because we don't want to antagonize Russia, that kind of kind of political narrative. It was never the case in Canada. All the major parties are basically pro-Ukrainian. So the Ukrainian diaspora is able essentially to function without being put, let's say, on the, uh, under the microscope in terms of our what they're demanding may be a little too much for Canadian interests vis-a-vis -vis Russia, which is you know, a former superpower, now at least a regional power with um, certainly nuclear capabilities. Yes. So the Ukrainian diaspora has that political space um, but, that it, and also has certainly the capacity that other Ukrainian diasporas don't uh, uh, have, particularly in Europe. You know, this has always been really interesting to me. And the, the, the question I'm going to ask can be answered simply, I suppose, by numbers. You know, the Ukrainian diaspora in Canada, given the size of the country's population and the, the size of the diaspora population is, um, as you said, both the country and the community kind of punch above their weight. But what is really interesting is that to live in a, uh, in a developed Western country with developed political and economic institutions where the churning of government, the churning, the processes of political politics isn't really that visible to the everyday person. How is it that this diaspora community is as politically aware and um, knowledgeable and active as you say it is? Why is it is it Canada as opposed to the United States, where you know being apolitical is a sign of of uh, <laughs> of pride here? Um, what is the difference here? Why is it that this diaspora community is able to be politically uh, aware, active, and savvy, not just at a superficial level? Yeah, obviously, each diaspora has its own internal issues. And I'm not saying that it has been from the even the Ukrainian Canadian perspective, a success story throughout. And you have, we have to be careful with numbers. If the census tells us, well, you've got 1.2 million Ukrainians, yes and no. There's 1.2 million will answer that they have Ukrainian roots, but the extent to which they're Ukrainian 
the Ukrainian part of their Kenyan identity is really meaningful outside of cultural matters and let's say religious or culinary or, uh, experience, um, that varies of course tremendously. And then you've got assimilation I mean, the, in terms of intermarriages and so forth. And so there has been like in all diasporas, um, a constant uh, refrain, let's say of, of community leaders and that uh, you know we could be stronger, we're losing our people and so forth. But what I think is the um, distinct here experience um, of uh, the Ukrainian diaspora in the post-war period is just a cal catastrophic, ex um, World War II, that is what that diaspora experienced during World War II and then in the DP camps and then coming to Canada, there was this almost multi-generational uh, determination to preserve the culture because there was a sense that Ukrainian culture was under existential threat under Soviet domination with Russification. Um, that was quite remarkable, even more than the United States. Actually, here in Canada, and particularly, uh, I speak here from Quebec, you see that in a lot of, uh, for a lot of communities, like even the Italian community or the Greek community, even the language uh, is trans transmits more through generations, second or third generations that you see in the United States. So you have, that's the multicultural experience here, as we define it in Canada. And when actually, since I, I, mean, I just mentioned the word, when the Canada um, officially announced a policy of multiculturalism in 1971, that was the first version of multiculturalism. The current version refers to uh, uh, visible minorities and indigenous people. And, but the first version of multiculturalism in the 70s was kind of a response to the policy of official bilingualism and this kind of recognition that Canada uh, had been created, had kind of two founding nations. But that was at a time when unfortunately the first nations, the indigenous people were not part of the conversation, shamefully. Um, but as a, as a reaction to the rise of Quebec nationalism, you had this official then uh, bilingualism, but then it's the Ukrainian Canadians, and you were talking 30 years, well, let's say 20 years before uh, Ukrainian independence that mobilized and they were, again, successful or um, they had the capacity basically yes. to politically pressure the government to, to come up with this alternative policy, which essentially said, well, in addition to the two founding nations, other nations uh, played a major role in the development of Canada, including the Ukrainians. Of course, as I mentioned that that's the all the the migration waves to uh, to um, Western Canada. Dr. Arel, let's talk about today um, and the both the res three things: how the Ukrainian diaspora receives its information about what is actually happening in this war. How is it reacting um, on both as individuals and as an organized diaspora? And um, well, I'll get to the other later. Let's let's do these two, please. Yeah, but 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 I think I mean the diaspora is getting the information like we're all getting it, and through the the, the medium social media um, on various platforms, predominantly Twitter, you've got basically in real time a, an incredible amount of information with people on the ground in all the cities in Kharkiv and Mariupol and uh, all the cities that are getting bombed. Um, so the information is out there for anyone who it's actually it's, it's overwhelming, um, but and, and they have their own, of course, private and, and family and professional channels uh, with uh, Ukrainians in, in, in Ukraine. And again, the, the response has been tremendous. The, the U Canada Ukraine Foundation, which is the let's say of all the, the the organizations that seek to, to donate money in, in, in emergencies is really the, the major one that, that has been, again, in existence for a long time. In, in the first five days of the war, it already raised $3 million. Um, so again, that capacity uh, to pull together 
at the local, provincial, and national level. And what about attended, actual hands-on yeah. work and volunteering? I don't mean military, although that yeah. too is an aspect, but um, you know, working with the media organizations. Uh, yeah. Indeed, but here in Canada, it's the 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 Ukraine, the, the Russia's war in Ukraine has been pretty much uh, blanket coverage, wall-to-wall -wall coverage on all medias for for two weeks. And of course, the a great many interviews are made by Canadian uh, Ukrainian, uh, either officials, actors, or, or simple people, um, here and there. And so, uh, but I mean there. I mean the you know the design. Yeah, I mean, the designer in Canada rolling up their sleeves and working with, I don't know, an organization or a media outfit yeah. in Ukraine, that sort of one-on-one -on -one, uh, capacity yeah. value. Yes, there, there's just too many examples for me to, to, to give you here in a few minutes. I mean, it's happening on all fronts. I and mean, what the... about politically? What about politically? What is other than this has to stop? What... Uh, what is the law being aimed at? Well, it's, Canada has been at the forefront quietly and not so quietly of this tremendous coordination among um, European and North American states and basically the, the NATO and EU members on economic sanctions. Um, did ha it happen very fast and much further much more severe than we even expected. Um, and I'm sure President Putin did not expect that kind of uh, unity, which again, it's very difficult to quantify, but Canada uh, played a role here behind the scenes to make sure that everyone was pulling together in constant communication with the Ukrainian government. Um, um, well, and, yeah, go ahead. The cynic, because we're running out of time, the cynic would say, uh, you know, yes, there's been tremendous support, vocal and economic, and there are plenty of people, you know, who are rah rah rahing that Ukraine is going to come out of this, you know, positively, favorably. Um, but it's, you know, let's fight to the last man, but it's the, let's fight to the last Ukrainian man. In other words, the talk and the action on the ground are part of what Stephen Krasner calls this organized hypocrisy, huh? Um, That's correct. But listen, obviously the diaspora has been pushing mightily for a no-fly zone. And of course, NATO has refused for fear that it would escalate into a, a direct uh, military confrontation with a nuclear power. We'll see where, where it leads us in a week or two. Um, that has been the situation, but the diaspora has been relentless, and so is President Zelensky. So in that sense, they work in, in unison. But then we learn that there's, um, there's actually right now a Canadian battalion operating in, in Kiev. Not officially, not part of the Canadian Armed Forces, of course not. These are volunteers with military experience, it would seem that many, perhaps even most, are not even of Canadian-Ukrainian uh, background, but they're part of a growing international brigade here to, to fight with Ukrainians. And it's very early, and Canada, uh, again, is playing a leading role, and you've got a very prominent and very wealthy community leader here in Canada that appears to be behind that. So we're talking here something unprecedented. You're actually sending unofficial military troops to go and fight with Ukrainians. The war is getting internationalized, even if it's not officially recognized. So there are things happening short of something that clearly NATO doesn't want to do and advertise for a long time that we're not about to go and fight directly Russia because that would mean World War III in terms of military confrontation, even though we are already in World War III in terms of the massive economic sanction. I mean, the, the, the economic sanctions, this is a weapon of war too, that has been used to such an extent that is unprecedented. Um, my last question isn't maybe a question, it's, it's a parallel that I can't help but draw between what Russia is doing with Ukraine and Ukrainians and what Azerbaijan does with Armenians. That is, on the one hand, say, these are our brothers, these are our citizens, these are ours. And then at the same time, 
perpetrate the kind of violence that is going to be very, very difficult to work back from. And even given all of the Ukrainian history with the Russians in the Soviet years, there was still cultural and uh, filial affinities there between Russians and Ukrainians. What happens now? That's a very deep question. Um, it's you know, it's all of ours, you know? It's, yeah, we're, we're two weeks into the war and the reality is that, you know, in his um, delusional construction of Ukraine, Putin is telling us that He's coming to save the real Ukrainians from the fascists. The fascists, meaning this representation, these Western Ukrainians who collaborated with, with the Nazis in World War II, etc. Um, th that's how it's presented, that the government is like neo-Nazi, even though the president is Jewish. I mean, that's the level of absurdity. But my point here is that we've been witnessing in, with increasing horror the indiscriminate bombing of cities. Now, these cities are not in this area of Ukraine that I talked about earlier, where you had the political migration. Yes. Um, the nationalists, so, because they came of the, the organization of Ukrainian nationalists. The bombing are taking place in Eastern Ukraine, where the cities are Ukrainian, of course, in terms of what people identify, but they're Russian speaking. People yes. would prefer to speak Russian. And he's raising these cities to the ground. And the Russian speakers can't understand why Russia so savagely is attacking them. And what it means is that Putin is breaking the very deep historical, linguistic, religious, familial bonds between Eastern Ukrainians and Russians. And that will take generations to restore. Amen. And uh, that can be said for so many places in the world, including, well, certainly the former Soviet space. Um, uh, Dr. Dominique Arel, thank you very much for your time. You. I thank think you. that there is going to be far more conversation about this before we know how to try to fix our world. Thank you very much. And thank you to those of you who are following this series, Armenia, Ukraine, and War. There is more to come, and we hope that you follow us on all of the podcast channels. This is Salpi Azarian, and I'm speaking to you from the University of Southern California Institute of Armenian Studies. This is Unpacking Armenian Studies. You've been listening to Unpacking Armenian Studies, a podcast series on the Institute of Armenian Studies channel. This episode has been produced by Sadin Habeshyan. Music by Josue Gonzalez. For more from the USC Institute of Armenian Studies, go to the Institute's YouTube channel to hear dozens of talks by scholars from all over the world. You can reach the Institute at armenian at usc.edu and follow the Institute on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. This podcast has been recorded at the University of Southern California Dornsife College of Letters, Arts, and Sciences. Thank you.